Welcome everyone and good evening. This is Amir Sarfati. I am here in Jerusalem. Today is May the 10th. It's Thursday evening in Jerusalem. It's already nighttime in Jerusalem. I know it's daytime in the US. It is evening in Europe and it is of course in the middle of the night in uh, Asia. Um, we're going to start this update with a prayer and, uh, and then we, we're going to dive into um, some very interesting information. So, Father, we thank you so much that you who keepeth Israel, you never slumber nor sleep. That he who touches Israel indeed touches the apple of your eye. And that you have shown in the last 24 hours your faithfulness in not only bringing your people back to your land, but also preserving your people while they're here in the land. So, Father, we thank you. We don't take the credit to ourselves. We understand that it is divine. It is divine and it is uh, quite miraculous to have a president like that in the U.S., and to have uh, such an amazing relationship between our prime minister and world leaders. And it is quite miraculous to see that such a big and quite strong enemy is trying its best to destroy your nation, your people, your sheltered ones. And it's amazing to see once again how you're faithful to your promises not to allow that to happen. We thank you. We bless you. We ask that this evening, in whatever we do and say, your name will be glorified throughout this update and throughout the teaching that will be following it. We thank you, Father, and we bless you from Jerusalem and from all over the world. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. I am so excited. If you only understood the level of excitement that I'm going through in the last few days, as an Israeli, as a Jew, as a believer, as a military person, as a person who leads tours to the land of Israel, it is hard to even explain the level of peace, safety, security, and um, in tranquility that we, we feel and we sense while we're here. I'm leading a group of 90 people. Not only that they're not afraid, they're laughing at the panic that is all over the world regarding the situation here. You know, throughout the entire um, events of last night, we were, I mean, everybody were asleep here. Nobody had a clue. I, I had to inform my group this morning as of what happened. 99% of the Israelis were asleep. Um, and, and, and allow me now to get to the details of the last 24 hours to give you an understanding of several things that happened behind the scenes and also to try and ask the question, will there ever be peace in the Middle East? And if so, when, how, for how long, who will introduce it, and what's going to end up with it? So we're going to deal with that just after this uh, short update that I'm going to give you. But um, just so you understand, folks, uh, before we continue, one of the major targets of President Donald Trump in uh, being in Syria uh, wasn't really stopping the Iranian entrenchment. The Iranian entrenchment was the problem of Israel. We, we of course, um, communicated that to President Trump. But from day one, President Trump said, our job in Syria is to defeat ISIS. And when we defeat ISIS, we really don't have much to do there. Well, one more thing happened today as the U.S. captured the top five leaders of ISIS. I don't know if you know that, but the personal aid, the personal assistant of the leader of ISIS was captured already two and a half months ago in Turkey. And they used his cell phone and the um, text um, application called Telegram on his phone 
to lure four other leaders into Syria. And the moment they crossed into Syria, they were captured. America, once again, is having a great success in its, um, in its foreign um, affairs against all the predictions of the liberal media all around the world. President Trump is doing the right thing, the right way, with the right people, and there is nothing but admiration here in Israel to a person who is so strong and resilient and, in, and, and is not really allowing world opinion to affect his convictions. Um, we're, we're quite amazed at that. Uh, to be honest with you, and I've been talking to pastors and a very good friend of mine, um, they said that if they thought that Reagan was the best thing that happened to Christians and to America, then Trump is outdoing Reagan within a, a year and a half. It's quite amazing to see the American economy, the fact that there's more jobs than people. I mean, some students are, are forced to leave the university earlier so they can get into the circle of, of work because it is unbelievable what's going on. Um, beyond that, America is becoming shortly the number one exporter of oil in the entire world. And... Uh, you have to understand that um, supporting Israel is not something that America does because America needs something from Israel. The President of the United States is convinced that Israel is part of the good guys that are uh, is helping him. They're not out there to, uh, to, to cause him to fail, but are out there to cause him to succeed. Uh, we provide him with the right intelligence, intelligence that the Europeans the Russians and the others will never give him in order to make up his mind and, and in order to form his opinion. But we also um, provide him with uh, the um, stability that every American president needs here in the Middle East. And we are telling exactly to the face of the whole world what is the element in the Middle East that causes such instability. Um, I know that some of you may think that I'm a big fan of, of President Trump. I'm not even an American. I'm not a Republican. I did not vote for him. I don't benefit from voting for him in my salary or uh, this is not uh, work that he gave me and this is not jobs that he gave me. I'm just looking and seeing someone who brought back the value of family, the value of the keeping the unborn and, and, and making sure not to kill them, and, and of course standing by Israel. These are three things that the former administration just uh, trampled on and, and destroyed and brought America to such a horrible situation. God, I believe, answered the prayers of millions of Christians in America and around the world, and at the very last minute before America almost disappeared. He gave President Trump to the Americans. To, and, and, and I, honestly, I don't think any other person could have done what he's doing because it took someone like him, who is not a politician, to do the things that he's doing, to withstand such pressure and to be so resilient and, and move forward. Unbelievable. So ISIS is suffering. King Jong-un just released the three American uh, prisoners and something that was done without having to pay him a dime. I want to remind you that Barack Obama had to release prisoners either with the exchange of terrorists to be released from Guantanamo Bay or with the exchange of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in cash. So you understand that when you're strong, and when you're serious, then the enemy will take you seriously and will be afraid of you and will respect you and will not demand anything back for releasing your people. Now, let's put what's going on in America aside and let's put what's going on with the North Korean side 
Although we just learned that on June 12th in Singapore, the summit of Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un will take place. But I'm going to put that aside and I'm just, I'm just going to take you all the way back to uh, two nights ago. If you remember, President Trump announced the withdrawal of America from the Iran deal. Probably 30, 40 minutes later, Israel striked um, some rocket launchers that were ready to launch rockets from the Syrian side. And I'm talking about Iranian rocket launchers. Uh, we, we destroyed a, a storage of, of rockets and we destroyed a convoy that was on its way to, to launch the rockets. And uh, you may not know that, but among the casualties was a, an Iranian general. When he was brought to a Syrian hospital, all the employees were asked to um, deposit their cell phones and not to use them in, just so they are not going to report or take pictures of the person himself. That, of course, caused the Iranians even more rage. Not only that they were not able to execute their revenge for what we did to them in February 10 uh, of, uh, of this year, but now their top general over there is dead as well. The Iranian decided, without informing Assad, without informing the Russians, and surely without, um, um, without asking anyone around, they decided last night that that's the time to do something. They brought out of their um, missile um, storage several short-range missiles that you can launch from a, at the back of a pickup truck. In uh, 10 past midnight, they launch a barrage of anything between 20 to 40 short-range missiles. They were so afraid of the Israeli reaction that as they launched it, they ran away. And most of the missiles never even crossed the border and did not even hit Israel. Only four rockets posed some, some sort of a threat and Israel shot them down. Of the entire barrage, not even a single Iranian rocket fell in Israeli territory. What a miracle. Israel waited. Israel waited for that opportunity. We waited to teach them a lesson. We already had a plan, a draw plan, that in case Iran is going to do anything to violate the sovereignty of Israel anywhere, we will have a very large-scale operation. And two hours after the barrage, Israel launched the largest airstrike since 1974 in Syria. Within an hour and a half, Israel, using 28 fighter jets, F-15s and F-16s, Israel destroyed 50 targets on the ground. More than 40 were Iranian targets, pure Iranian targets. And because the Syrians did not listen to us and started shooting with their air defense system at the Israeli planes, we destroyed five air defense systems of the Syrian army. Ladies and gentlemen, if the Iranians knew what Israel was about to do, they would have never launched those stupid I don't even know how to say uh, um, uh, meaningless barrage that hit nothing, did nothing, and yet caused so much damage to them. It was not a victory. It was a knockout in this round. And the funny thing of all is immediately America stood by our side. Later on, the Iranians were shocked to know that we informed the Russians, and the Russians even gave us a green light to do that. The Germans and the French said that Israel has a right to defend itself. And believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, Bahrain, Muslim Sunni country, said every country has the right to defend itself, including Israel. So the Iranians are so isolated. The Arab world is not with them. Europe is not with them. 
America is not with them, and even Vladimir Putin, who hosted Benjamin Netanyahu yesterday and gave him the highest honor any world leader can get by being invited into the most important ceremony in Russia, and that is the marking of the day of victory over Nazi Germany. Ladies and gentlemen, President Putin understand one thing. I do not want Bashar al-Assad to be toppled. I am not going to allow Iran to destabilize the region and by doing so cause the regime to fall. I prefer weak Assad in the palace than a gang of ISIS or other um, uh, rebels um, taking over Syria, just like they, t- they did in, in, in Libya and other places. President Putin understand that his interest in the Middle East and in Syria in particular, the oil and the gas and the, ha- the fact that he has warm water uh, harbor for his fleet, this is something he will not uh, give up so easily. And I noticed some of you are saying, wait a minute, Amir, we, we thought that all the time you, you said that Russia is not a friend of Israel and Russia is going to attack Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, everything has its time and its season. At the moment, Israel's being friends of Russia serves the Russian interest. The Russians are very disturbed with the Iranian entrenchment as well. Iran, over the last three years, brought 4,000 Iranian commanders, 8,000 Hezbollah people from Lebanon, 40,000 militias that were recruited in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and 40,000 local militias that they recruited from within Syria. This is a huge army that Russia was even threatened by. And you need to understand that for the Russians at the moment, it is way more important that Iran will not destabilize the area than the business with Iran. The business with Iran, they will do, with Iran in Iran. But Iran's arm in Syria is a problem for the Russians. You you don't understand that probably, but Iran is 1,500 miles away. And they are now, they advanced all of their military and all of their commandments and all of their units to Syria. In other words, they brought everything a mile away from Israel. So basically, as long as Iranians are in Iran, nobody has a problem with that. And Russia doesn't have a problem with that either. But the Iranians, when they are not in Iran, but they are, when they are in Syria, everybody has a problem with that. Not only Israel, by the way. And therefore, Netanyahu had a very good conversation with Putin. And when he got back to Israel, he basically told the cabinet and the leadership of the military, if the Iranians will violate our sovereignty, I have the green light from the Russians to do what we need to do. We informed the Russians last night that we're about to strike, and the Russians allowed us to do that. You understand that the Russians have quite a a strong military presence in Syria. And the last thing Israel needs right now is a clash with Russia. So, ladies and gentlemen, Iran is today way more humiliated and weak than it was yesterday. And uh, General Qasem Soleimani, the leader of the Al-Quds Special Forces. Al-Quds is a whole brigade dedicated to the destruction of Israel. Al-Quds means Jerusalem. They're dedicated to the destruction of Israel and Jerusalem becoming back a Muslim city, the capital of the Muslims around the world, or the capital of, or, of, 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 a, of a Muslim country. You must understand, unless you read the ninth surah of the Quran, you, you will never be able to understand that the, the, the whole concept behind what the Iranians are doing. People try to appease them. 
People try to reason why is it that they're doing what they're doing. People don't understand. Their motivation has nothing to do with money and it has nothing to do with oil or gas and it is not political. They will not accept any political arrangement having Israel still standing and the Jews still alive on Israeli soil. It is a, it is a spiritual warfare and it is a religious conflict that we have in the Middle East. And the first to detect that was President Trump when he realized the whole deal means nothing because there's no one to talk to and there's nothing to talk about with people that their agenda is jihadist. It, 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 you can't sit with them because they lie to your face and their agenda is actually to destroy you. And it's a religious agenda. Unlike King Jong-un, all he wants, by the way, is money. And by the way, President Trump is giving him nothing. The only thing he gives him is, I'm, I'm giving you time to live or else I can just bring you to the Stone Age. He's getting no money. He might get business if he opens himself up to investments and stuff. That's fine. But what we see here is a completely different picture. President Trump understand, by the way, he will not bring peace to the Middle East. If you read between the lines in his speech right after he launched the strike in Syria last month, President Trump said to the whole world, there is no amount of dollars or not enough American blood that can ever be poured or invested in the Middle East that can ever bring peace. We will not be able to do that. If the sides will want to do that, they will have to do it themselves. We cannot do it for them. He's now putting all of his efforts in at least bringing an end to other conflicts that were existential threats to America, such as the North Korean one. And, you are, and he deserves a Nobel Peace Prize, there's no doubt about that. And the summit that is going to have in Singapore on June 12th will be a summit in which it will bring an end to the Korean Peninsula conflict. That for us is also a good thing because the last thing we need is North Korea continuing uh, collaborating with Iran and, and the rest of our enemies. Don't forget that in 2007, Israel destroyed a nuclear reactor in Syria that was built by the North Koreans. So, so finishing with the North Korean uh, um, conflict is a great thing. But you know that President Trump is not going to force anything on Israel just by the mere fact that he decided to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and to move the embassy. For all those years, American presidents refrained from doing that because they knew that part of their future deal is to divide Jerusalem between Israel and the Palestinians. So they are not going to take unilateral um, actions and they are not going to appease one side only. Jerusalem is only left for negotiations comes President Trump and says, I'm sorry, but you must be out of your mind. This is the capital of Israel for the last 70 years. The Prime Minister sits there, the Parliament is there, the Supreme Court is there, the entire government is there. That's their capital. And that's their right to decide which is their capital. Nobody decided for the Americans which city will be their capital but the Americans. Nobody decided for the French which city will be their capitals but the French. And so nobody can decide for the Israelis which city is their capital but the Israelis. And if the Israelis say that's their capital, then that's their capital. We have to acknowledge that, we have to respect that, and we have to move our embassy to that place. And by the way, if the Israelis want to divide their capital and give something to someone else, that's fine. We will not stop them. But it's between the parties. We cannot impose anything. President Trump understood that the gap between the parties is so big that there is no point in, in even trying to fix anything between the Israelis and Palestinians. And he moved to the new strategy of let's first mend the, 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 the rift between 
Israel and the rest of the Muslim world. Bahrain is now saying that you know, Israel has the right to defend itself. Saudi Arabia is praising the decision of Donald Trump to withdraw from the nuclear um, deal. Although Saudi Arabia voted yay for the deal because they thought, well, let's do whatever we can to stop the Iranians from, from reaching a bomb. They always wished that Netanyahu at some point will convince an American regime to cancel it or to withdraw from it. And that is exactly what happened. For the first time in the last 70 years, Saudi Arabia, the king, and Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, are on the same side. By the way, that is exactly what Ezekiel chapter 38 is all about. Sheba and Dedan is not part of those who attack Israel, but they are part of those who, who, who are criticizing the attack on Israel. Very, very interesting. So now we understand that we're coming to the point where President Trump understands, if, if anything, why don't I connect Israel with the Saudis and the Bahrainis and and the, and the uh, EU, excuse me, uh, the uh, uh, United Emirates and, and, and other, and Kuwait and other places. And, and when there is a regional peace that might somehow push forward the Palestinians to do the same. But he's not going to divide Jerusalem. He's not going to impose anything on the Israelis. He understands that it's not going to work. That's why he puts all of his effort in defending Israel, which is the only stable thing in the Middle East, and in fixing the problem in the, in the Korean Peninsula. And in between, making America great again. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand that what happened last night is just one more round between us and the Iranians. The Iranians are weak. Let me remind you something. I was not alive at that time, and I know many of you were not probably, but in 1967, the leader of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, made a very big tactical mistake. He had a very big and strong air force. And Israel's jets, fighter jets, were very limited and, and, and not that sophisticated in the range. What Nasser did, he brought all of his air force to the Sinai Peninsula. And by doing that, ladies and gentlemen, he actually caused all of his air, air force to be within the range of the Israeli jets. And that's how we destroyed his air force within 30 minutes on June 5th, 1967. And the Iranians are doing exactly the same mistake. They bring all of their brigades and all of their commanders and all of their equipment to Syria below our eyes and nose. Israel has absolute domination over what's going on in Syria. We know every movement of every launcher and every airplane and every soldier for the last 40 years we had peace and, and and it was quiet in Syria because the Syrians knew we know everything comes the Iranians and look what we have right now the Iranians don't understand the level of the Israeli intelligence on Syrian ground is so amazing that we not only detect every movement but we warn them in advance don't move we know what you're about to do. And the minute they move, we destroy things. Allow me to think out loud that maybe we even didn't mind them shooting that barrage last night so we can go in and take care of business. So the Iranians are doing the same mistake that the, the Egyptians did before. And... Uh, I believe that at the moment, Putin prefers Israel to stop the Iranian entrenchment so Assad will stay in power 
As long as Israel makes the distinction between Assad and Iran and say, our problem is with Iran, not with Assad, the Russians will be on our side. The minute Assad will be toppled, the Russians will come against us. And this is exactly why I always said that Isaiah 17, that speaks of the destruction of Damascus, will be the match that light the fire of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Because only once the regime in Damascus is gone, then Russia will feel that Israel has to pay for it. And that's, of course, Iranians will join them, and the, and the Turks will join them, and the, the Libyans will join them, and the Sudanese will join them, and Ezekiel 38 and 39 will come to pass. But at the moment, as long as the distinction between Assad and Iran is done, the Russians don't mind that we take care of business. If the Iranians will do something stupid and will drag Israel to topple Assad because they might get Assad to help them, that will be a game changer. And this is when I will tell you, Guys, the war of Gog and Magog is now about to begin. So, I, I think we understand right now the situation. Israel is back to routine, back to normal. Benjamin Netanyahu an hour ago said, if someone is going to attack us, we will attack him tenfold. And if someone is contemplating on attacking us, we will attack him before. So basically what we said is this. To the Iranians and the Syrians, don't even think about attacking us. Because if you do, you're going to regret that. But also, we're saying, don't even work and prepare for some strike. Because we will prevent it before it even happens. Guys, zero tolerance is the only way to deal with the Iranians. That's what it's all about. Now, um, I hope that you understand that um, although the world leaders are always talking about peace, um, in the Middle East, as uh, the way I see it, and you know that the Bible, 95% of the Bible is written either about events in Israel or regarding the people of Israel. So when the Bible talks about peace, the Bible talk about, talks about peace here in this area. The Bible is not talking about North Korea and, and the peninsula there. Everything around the world eventually is affected by what is going on here in the Middle East. The culmination of world events will always be around that which is happening right here. And I'd like to tell you something. You know, I'm going to read from Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 6 to 10. And the Bible says this. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have spoken nonsense and envisioned lies, Therefore, I am indeed against you, says the Lord God. My hand will be against the prophets who envision futility and who divine lie and who divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, nor be written in the record of the house of Israel, nor shall they Enter into the land of Israel. And then you shall know that I am the Lord God. Because indeed, because they have seduced my people saying peace when there is no peace. And one builds a wall and they plaster it with untempered mortar. Saying to those who, who plaster it with untempered mortar that it will fall. Ladies and gentlemen. The Lord is telling everyone. The Lord is telling everyone. Do not. 
prophesy falsely peace when there is no peace. Even Jeremiah the prophet said, they try to heal the wound of my people by saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. There will be no peace. Now I know that in Hebrews, the Bible says that we should strive to have peace and of course that holiness without which we will not see the Lord. We, we as believers, we need to strive always to live in peace. But Israel is a country that is, is surrounded by enemies. And the enemies are using religious ideology. For them, if Israel is standing there, then their holy book is wrong. And such a thought is inconceivable. So the existence of Israel is a problem for them. Therefore, they're not going to be a day without an attempt to somehow do something to us. And that's why when the Bible says that he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Maybe it's a cliche for many of you. Maybe it's a slogan for many of you. This is reality for me every day. <laughs> you know, we're, we're surrounded by so many of them. Hamas and Islamic Jihad in the south, ISIS on the east, Hezbollah in the north, Iran around, all of that. They're not our friends. But the interesting thing is that so many things happen over the last 70 years. The first tier of enemies is no longer there. There is no more Syria, per se. Jordan and Egypt are at peace with Israel. Saudi and Bahrain are now friends with Israel. Things are not what they used to be. Ladies and gentlemen, the next thing is, of course, Ezekiel's war. So there is coming a war, not peace, to the Middle East. Therefore, I think Trump is extremely smart to understand. If anything, I better put all my effort on bringing peace to the uh, Korean Peninsula. Because in the Middle East, with all the elements that are, are all around, it will definitely, is, it, it won't happen. And I want you to know that as long as we can live in peace, for us every day is, is, is a victory. You understand, Israel is not sitting and blaming others all day long. Israel is blooming, thriving. Israel is, is our economy is thriving. Think about it. You would expect with such an Iranian threat that the Israeli shekel will collapse. It is the strongest currency in the Western Hemisphere right now. The Iranian real is collapsing. We're not even, you know, we went to school this morning. We went to work this morning. We, we, we are not caving in. We're not shaken and we're not, for us, it's a given. They don't like us, but we move on. By the way, just so you know, the Iranian president, as we speak right now, just said, Iran is not interested in escalation. Somebody got the memo, I think. But I want you to know, I want you to know, folks, that a war is around the corner, and that is, of course, the Ezekiel's war. And when that war will come to pass, then peace will be introduced to our region. So I'm not suspecting Trump to bring false peace because he's not going to bring peace. But I am suspecting Europe to produce the guy who will eventually bring the false peace to the Middle East. Once Russia is defeated, Turkey is defeated, Iran is defeated, Libya and Sudan are defeated, and basically, in a way, Islam is defeated, then the Europeans are going to emerge into the scene as those who bring peace to the Middle East. The Antichrist, I believe, will come from the revived Roman Empire. People suggest that he's going to come. He's the leader of Turkey. No such thing. The Turkish president is the greatest anti-Semite we ever seen in the last, I don't know how many years. For a Messiah, for a, for a person to be the Antichrist, he needs to be perceived as Messiah to the Jewish people, to Israel. Israel needs to love him, adore him. Fall for him. 
It's not Erdogan. It will surely be someone who will bring peace once Turkey is defeated. And that is, I believe, someone that will emerge from either Germany, France, or the whole area of this revived uh, new Roman Empire. And I believe that he will bring peace. He will introduce peace. And I believe that everybody will be so tired of that war that they will embrace that peace deal. But that peace deal will be so in favor of Israel that it will cause the Israelis to want it. Because eventually, according to Daniel 9, we see that the peace that is going to be introduced is going to be a peace that will allow them to have once again temple on the Temple Mount. Do you see a possibility for the Jewish people to have a temple on the Temple Mount right now? No, World War III will begin. But once Islam is defeated in Ezekiel's war, and once the spirit of the Antichrist of always leads to God, and let's just be tolerant to one another, let's hold hands and sing, we're the world. Once that comes to pass, and then of course, maybe the Dome of the Rock can still be standing as some sort of a monument to a already a defeated religion, but the temple for the Jewish people will be standing. There is a vacant area right there, north of the dome. It's still there. And it stands in perfect, align uh, 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 perfect alignment with the, the eastern gate of today. And that peace will be a very limited peace because the Antichrist himself, once the temple is ready, and the Jews are excited. And then the Antichrist is going to say, I'm sorry, but I am God to be worshipped in this temple. Remember the Jewish people, they rejected Jesus because, not because he was Messiah, but because he claimed to be God. That's the blasphemy that they accused him for. So the Jews are going to say, excuse me, excuse us. Messiah is a human being, not God. So if you claim to be God, you're obviously not the Messiah. You're obviously not the one we've been waiting for. And that's the moment Jacob's trouble will begin. And unfortunately, unfortunately, he will come against the Jewish people in such a way that it will be, it will be such a terrible time. So again, peace? Absolutely not. You know, the, the interesting thing is, you know, uh, as believers, we, we have to be always reminded of, of what the Lord Jesus himself said when he, when he was asked all of these things. You know, it, it, was, it was never, hey, everything is going to be great. Hey, you know, I, I, I promise you garden of roses. You know, Jesus himself said, that um, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars and nations shall rise against nation. You know, in John 16, he said, These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus says, hey, if you want to find peace, it's not going to be in this world. It's not going to be the UN. It's not going to be Trump. It's not going to be anyone. And even the one who will bring peace to the Middle East, even that man is a false Messiah because he will not be able to keep that peace for even longer than three and a half years. So will there be peace in the Middle East? Now, absolutely not. Now, it doesn't mean that Israel is not, is not safe and secure and prosperous. It is. <laughs> We're very safe, extremely secured, and extremely prosperous. But we don't have the peace. And all those false prophets that are telling people, peace, peace, when there is no peace, God, as Ezekiel said, will judge them. 
Now, where can we find peace? And when can we find peace? Jesus in John 14 said, Peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In Philippians 4, 7, it says, And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 2 Thessalonians 3.17 says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always and in every way. The world will deceive you. When they say peace and safety, as 1 Thessalonians 5.3 says, then sudden destruction will come upon them as, as birth pangs upon a preg pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. There is peace that you can have right now. If you don't have it, it's the Prince of Peace. It's the Lord of Peace that can give you peace that surpasses all understandings. It's the peace that the world cannot give. It's the peace that the world cannot even understand. The world will deceive you, send you false prophets and false messiahs. And God predicted that in the prophet Ezekiel and in the prophet Jeremiah. He knew that it's going to happen. He said that to the people of Israel then, as much as he's telling all of us even today. So my, my prayer is that we all understand that There is no other source of peace but the Prince of Peace. And when the Prince of Peace will return, and when His feet will stand on Mount of Olives, then this, this land will enjoy a thousand years peace. And by the way, even that thousand years peace will somehow come to an end when Satan will be released for a short time from the bottomless pit. And he will go out and, and deceive the nations and bring people from the four corners of the world against the camp of the beloved ones. So you see, man's heart is so deceitful. It's so evil. It's so wicked. Peace is not something you can find in this world. It's the peace of God that will eventually be the only thing that you can count on. And the Bible says, even when the world has no peace, you will have peace because He has overcome this world. So I'm so encouraged that speaking about the Lord and preaching the Word of God and evangelizing is not only about seeing people uh, um, having great relationship with God, but also seeing people finally finding their peace. And if this city behind me, see the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, if this city would have accepted him 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, Jerusalem, if you only knew the things that make for your peace, I am your peace. I am the Prince of Peace. But you did not. Jerusalem rejected him. Jerusalem missed its visitation. Do you want to miss your visitation? You don't. The good, word, the good thing about Jerusalem is he's going to come back here and establish his kingdom here. And that's when the city of Jerusalem will finally be Yerushalayim with the word Shalom within it. The city of peace. But until Jesus comes back, trust me, you really need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Because it will not have peace. It cannot have peace. It shall not have peace. Because the only peace that, is, that can be sustained, that can, that, that can be a, a real and lasting one, is the peace that can come to you when you accept the Lord of peace who can give you peace now and in every way 
always and in every way. The Antichrist can give you peace, not always, but only for three and a half years, and only in a limited place, for a limited time, in a limited fashion. That's it. He's going to deceive the whole world for what? Three and a half years. Jesus has been giving peace to his disciples, to his followers, for more than 2,000 years now. So, my prayer is that in light of all that is going on, and trust me, we are going to talk about more, more conflicts and more clashes, and it's going to happen. If you have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, that you can sit and talk about these things without being fearful, without panicking, even with a smile, because we know where we're going. Paul said that his greatest prayer is that he may finish the race with joy. We need to have the joy of the Lord, even in these days. In fact, more so in these, in these days. You know, I, I'm so amazed. I cannot believe that I live in the 21st century where so many things in, in such magnitude, biblically, are taking place. My, great, my grandparents wish they could see what I see. And here we are. We watch it. We see it. We watch Russia, and we watch Iran, and we watch Turkey, and, and we watch Sudan, and, and we watch Jerusalem back in our hands, and we watch the Jews return back to their land, and we watch the land being healed, and the language being restored, and the people coming back to their land from the four corners of the world after 2,000 years. There's no such thing that ever happened to any nation on planet Earth. We are watching things that the prophets prophesied and promised, and no one had seen it before. And we are the generation. And now it's 70 years. Who knows? Maybe that's the number of a generation. I don't know. But if it is, then soon we're out of here. You know, I, I am not a prophet. I always tell people that I come from a nonprofit organization. That's what Behold Israel is all about. But I can tell you one thing. I believe in the words of the prophet. That's why I don't call... I mean, I, I, I was convicted not to call it prophecy update because I don't update the prophecy. But I believe in the importance of what the prophet said. And the Bible, Jesus said to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe that which the prophets had spoken. Don't be foolish and slow of heart to believe. The prophets have spoken. You better believe. All it, all it takes is belief. Abraham's, his faith was counted for him as righteousness. You, you'll never keep enough the Sabbath. and You'll never eat enough kosher. You'll never do enough good deeds to justify yourself. Your righteousness can come directly from your faith. And your faith comes directly in your security and, and, and understanding of the promises that we have. Promises that were communicated to all of us through the prophets. So I want to encourage all of you, in light of world events, and trust me, we're going to talk almost once a week, and maybe even more than that, on world events. This is all about to get your attention that the Lord is there doing His work Everything falls in the right place. And we, the people of God, must do our job to be watchmen on the walls, to occupy and spread the gospel in these last days, share the word, and give people that peace that only the Prince of Peace can give. So if you really want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you need to pray that the people of Israel will know their Messiah. That's the true peace of Jerusalem. Giving money for, for the sake of peace initiatives, for the sake of inner denomination or some sort of ecumenical movement, that's not the peace. 
you know, it's not about unity. It's about doctrine. And the doctrine is important. And the doctrine is that if you don't believe in Him, and follow His ways, and acknowledge your sinful nature, repent and accept Him as your Lord and Savior, and then share the great things of the One who took you out of darkness into His marvelous light, then you don't do your job. That's what we're all about. So I want to encourage all of you, Fulfill your mandate. Will there be peace in the Middle East? Now? No. Later on, after the war, it's going to be a false peace. After that, a terrible time. And then the Prince of Peace will come. And then there will be peace. But even when He come, the only way you can have peace is if you believe in Him and you accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Let me proclaim the ironic blessing upon all of us. I want to remind you to follow us on Instagram, Behold Israel. On Facebook, go ahead please and, and like uh, and follow us. In, uh, on YouTube, you want to subscribe to my YouTube because I have a very bad feeling that my days in Facebook might be numbered. So subscribe on Behold Israel YouTube channel. And maybe if you're not into any of the social media, just get our newsletter by going to our website, beholdisrael.org, and uh, put your email address and get our weekly updates. So let me pray over you the ironic blessing. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai panav elecha v'yichunecha. Isa Adonai Panavelecha the Yasemlecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. Shalom. That's the peace that surpasses all understanding. The Prince of Peace, the Lord of Peace that can give you peace always and in every way. In the name of Yeshua, the Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you. God bless you. Continue to stay tuned with, with my teachings and the updates. Um, and um, be encouraged. The Lord is good. God bless you and Shalom from Jerusalem. Bye-bye.